all the president's men for the third or fourth time because I enjoy it so much. It's very flattering to journalists, so I love the story. <laughs> um, and I was struck upon watching it early on in, in the movie, if you'll recall, the burglars have just been arrested and they are arraigned. And there's a scene where James McCord, the former CIA man who's under arrest, is asked by the judge, where do you work? And he says, the CIA. And there's 28-year-old Bob Woodward in the audience. And he says, holy shit. <laughs> and he runs back to the office. And I later got the call logs from the CIA Public Affairs Office. And about 30 minutes after McCord uttered those words, there is a call from the Washington Post to the CIA saying, who is this guy and does he work for you? So very intriguing, right? That is literally the last time in the, All the President's Men and in the Washington Post account of Watergate that the CIA is mentioned. And when I saw the movie many years later, it, it finally struck me. It was like, well, what happened to that story? You know, like, what, what happened? And so I think really this book began when I thought, there's got to be more to it than that. And that thought was the, was the germ or the embryo of this book which came to focus on the story that Woodward and Bernstein in the Washington Post didn't get, which was the story of the hidden hand of the CIA in the events that we call Watergate. What are the key findings of the book? What was the hidden hand of the CIA? Well, I think that the, the best way to understand that is to rewind the story back to about six years, eight years before the Watergate break-in, the summer of 1964, when Ian Fleming dies. Ian Fleming, of course, was the author of the James Bond books, which by, not, by the summer of 1964 had been made into three movies, Dr. No, Goldfinger, and Thresh with Love, all of which were huge hits. And Ian Fleming was a former intelligence officer. He had belonged to the British Intelligence Service, the Secret Intelligence Service, it's called, or MI6, during World War II, and after he had retired, and he had started writing the James Bond books. Well, in the, in, in the 1950s, they weren't, they, they sold well, okay, in England. They weren't really popular in the United States until in 1961, President-elect Kennedy was asked what were his 10 favorite books of the year, and From Russia with Love was one of them. And so Ian Fleming's book immediately shot to number one, or up the bestseller list in the United States, thanks to JFK's attention. And the book started to sell, and the movies followed. The result was this tremendous boom for British intelligence. I mean, British intelligence, objectively speaking, was in very bad shape in the 1960s. The, the British Empire was collapsing. They'd lost their former colonies in Palestine and in India. Um, uh, they were broke, the Americans had succeeded, the United Kingdom as the great world power, and all of that. But you wouldn't know it from reading a James Bond book or watching the movies. You know, you would think that the secret intelligence, British secret intelligence was the coolest thing on earth. These were the good guys, they, James Bond was so cool. Well, when Fleming died, Richard Helms, the deputy director of the CIA, went to his friend Howard Hunt, a former, uh, a, a current CIA officer, and said, Howard, this is a magnificent opportunity, okay? This is eight years before the burglary. Um, Howard Hunt was a career CIA officer um, and a prolific novelist in his own right. And H Helms' idea was Hunt would become the Ian Fleming of the CIA. He would write popular, accessible books that glamorized the CIA. They would get made into movies and this would fortify the public image of the CIA in the American mind. And so this wasn't just a passing idea that Helms had. It was a real project. And so he actually, in 1966, he goes to Hunt and he says, why don't you take a year off, go to Spain, and write these books? And so off he goes. Now, the other people in the CIA are saying, what exactly is Hunt going to be doing in Spain? Is he going to be doing any intelligence work? Helms wouldn't explain anything. The CIA people later asked around, and they, they came back and said, you know, like, no, he, did, he had no formal duties whatsoever. This was a paid vacation to write these books. And so he sits down and writes these books, starring a C glamorous CIA agent named Peter Ward, who's a, you know, bon he's kind of a knockoff of James Bond. He's a, a 
bit of a bon vivant and uh, you know, women falling at his feet and various adventures with communist bad guys all around the world. One of the books starts, opens with a burglar. Um, and in the burglary, Peter Ward, who's a knockoff of Howard Hunt, is sitting in a hotel room across the street from where the men are doing the burglary. And he's watching them, listening on the radio as they carry off this burglary. It is exactly, exactly what happened in Waterdeep. Hunt was sitting in the hotel across the street and the burglars were breaking in over there. In the book, his burglars managed not to get caught. In real life, Hunt's looking there and he sees the police break in, draw their guns, and he realizes he is in big, big trouble. Throws all this stuff in the car, flees the scene of the crime, becomes a fugitive, and eventually is indicted and becomes one of the one of the burglars who goes on trial and is sentenced to a long jail term. So what is what is the story of, of Howard Hunt? What does this backstory tell you about, um, about this, the CIA? And I think there's a couple of things. You know, one was Howard Hunt, the chief burglar, was very good friends with the director of the CIA at the time of the burglary. This was a story that the Washington Post and everybody else never figured out until years later. People knew that Helms and Hunt were acquainted. And when, when Helms was asked in, by the Senate Watergate Committee, did he remember Hunt, a man who he had lunch with three to six times a year, had been involved in you know, multiple operations, uh, had rescued Hunt and his wife from various mishaps within the CIA bureaucracy. Hunt sort of studies the distance, <laughs> lights, and says, uh, oh, Mr. Hunt, uh, a bit of a romantic, but um, and, and really pretends that he has no idea who he is. All the senators completely fall for it. But that was one th one significant revelation in this book. The hidden hand of the CIA was Howard Hunt was very close to the director at the time of the burglary. In fact, just a month before the burglary in May 1972, Helms was trying was still trying to sell Hunt's books to Hollywood. He had a meeting, at the, there was a, a screening of the, the Godfather in May 1972. It was when The Godfather came out. Big hit. And the head of Paramount Pictures, the head of Paramount Pictures was a friend of Vic Helms. As director of the CIA, he knew who to cultivate. And so he, he says, oh, you know, here's Mr. Hunt's books. You know, why don't you make a movie about it? Mission Impossible, it just started that year. It was a hit TV show. That was the first year of Mission Impossible. And the CIA was still thinking, how do we glamorize ourselves? So year, six years after he sends Hunt on this sabbatical to write the Peter Ward books, of which Hunt wrote five, um, Helms is still pushing the books on Hollywood. The point there is to understand that the CIA is not only the dirty tricks department of the US government with a license to kill and steal on behalf of US policymakers, but it's also a soft power institution that looks to influence public opinion in ways that you might not think. You would say, why would the CIA care about some stupid movie? You know, why would the CIA care? Because it would glamorize the institution and protect it from public criticism. And Dick Helms, as a real canny spy master, that was part of his agenda, as well as running secret operations and assassinations and all of that. So the story, part of the story, is the CIA is a soft power institution. Um, I think that there's also, it, it illuminates the perennial principle or truth that art imitates life, which imitates art. The hero of the Peter Ward books was Peter Ward, and his boss was a man named Avery Thorne, the deputy director of the CIA. Avery Thorne is a dead ringer for Dick Helms. And so Hel they're, 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 they're promoting their own mythology um, as a way of protecting the institution. And this is going on right up until the burglary, uh, you know, kind of ruins the, everything for both of them. But the important part of that is that this book looks at the Watergate affair not as it's traditionally looked at, which is a chapter in the presidency of Richard Nixon. Nixon had these burglars. He covered up. All the president's men went to jail. The crusading press uncovered it all. And, you know, the good guys won. That's kind of the Washington Post all the president's men narrative. And like I say, us journalists loves it because it makes us look good. But that was really not 
the whole of the story and the, the, the CIA part of the story was completely was completely missed going uh, going forward. What are the revelations of the book? That's kind of the general perspective of the book. Like what's what are the new facts? And I think the most important thing that the book has there is the backstory of these two men, Richard Nixon, 35th president, and Richard Helms, the eighth director of the CIA. Um, Helms is a career CIA officer, had joined the CIA from its inception in 1947. Um, a very careful, methodical man, a good bureaucrat, kept his bases covered, didn't antagonize anyone, cultivated friends from left to right in Washington, and slowly climbed up the ladder to the CIA, finally becoming director in 1966. Richard Nixon is a poor boy from, West, uh, from the West Coast, completely the opposite of Helms as a social type, uh, from a poor family. Helms is from a rich family on the East Coast. Uh, Nixon's very resentful of the CIA and people like him. But in terms of the mission, they're pretty much on the same wavelength. Nixon, in his paranoia, assumed that Helms, because he was an East Coast guy, very well-spoken, was a liberal. Because Nixon thought everybody who was well-dressed and came from the Ivy League was a liberal, <laughs> which was ridiculous. Dick Helms was a hard-line anti-communist hawk, just like Richard Helms, just like Richard Nixon. But the two men had trouble getting along after Nixon is elected in 1968, just because they're so different. And Helms is so, I mean, Nixon is so suspicious of Helms. Helms is a very deft manager of men, and so he realizes Nixon has this perennially wounded pride. You know, Nixon always felt put upon. Um, he was always fighting back, acting out his resentments against these elites that he didn't like. And so Helms flatters him relentlessly. And you know, flattery will get you everywhere. This story proves that that is so true. <laughs> um, that's how Helms gets on Nixon side. He writes him little notes and he says, Dear Mr. President, you were magnificent last night. Your statesmanship is unparalleled in the history of mankind. That kind of thing. It was, it was very shameful. And it worked because other times you could hear Nixon on the Watergate tape saying, ah, let's fire this guy Helms. You know, what is the CIA anyway? One time he says, 40,000 people sitting out there in Langley reading newspapers. You know, they're useless. But he keeps, he keeps Nixon on. He keeps Helms keeps Nixon on his side and he keeps his job. One part of that, as you, if you study the relationship, is they had a lot of secrets on each other. You know? And Howard Baker, in the middle of the Howard Baker was the senator from Tennessee. He was the co-chairman of the Senate Watergate Committee. And they asked him one time, about, they asked Baker about Nixon and Helms. And, and Baker said, Nixon and Helms have so much on each other, neither of them can even breathe. And that was really true. They really knew the dirty side of, of each other. And it, the main thing that they knew was the story that was well buried in 1972, but was kind of underneath the surface, which was the story of the CIA plots to assassinate Fidel Castro. Castro had come to power in Cuba in 1959 as a leftist, but not a communist. Um, and there was a lot of disagreement in the United States about how to respond. He had overthrown a pro-American government. He had abolished racial segregation in Cuba, which was quite shocking to the South, which was still the Jim Crow South. Um, he begins expropriating American companies. And the US government, and the CIA in particular, decide early on they're going to get rid of the guy. And so Nixon is vice president under Eisenhower. Eisenhower's in his last, term, last year of his second term. Nixon appoints himself as the, the front man of a policy to get rid of Castro. Uh, Helms is a, by now a senior CIA official, and he's very involved in the CIA's plans to, to do exactly that. And one key operative in that whole unfolding situation in 1959 and 1960 is Helms' good friend, Howard Hunt. He had been, he had been a top CIA operative in Latin America since 1951. And they send him to Cuba in 1960 to find out what's going on with Castro. Hunt comes back with a four-point plan. The first point in the plan is assassinate Fidel Castro. 
And so this is the, this is, these are the recommendations that the CIA and the National Security Council are considering in 1959 and 1960. So Helms knows about these plans because they're being formulated by CIA staff. And Nixon knows about these plans because he supports them and wants to overthrow, overthrow Castro. So they, the CIA then proceeds to launch a series of operations to, to do exactly that, to assassinate Castro. Um, Hunt is involved in, in one of them, which is broken up. Um, eventually, the CIA creates, investigates itself and identifies there were six different plots to kill Castro in the first, between 1960 and 1963. And, and Hunt was involved in the first one, and Helms was involved, and Helms ran the last one. So, and, and Nixon certainly knew about the first couple of them, um, because Hunt was working closely with his man on the National Security Council. Anyway, the, this story of how the CIA had plotted to kill Castro was completely unknown until 1967, when Drew Pearson, the syndicated columnist, got wind of it. Um, in one of the plots, the CIA had hired two mafia figures and paid for $150,000 to arrange the assassination of Castro. And they said that the mafia bosses, Sam Giancana and Johnny Rosselli, said they would poison Castro. And so the CIA, the wizards of the CIA's technical services division, came up with these poison pills. They gave them to the mafia guys who delivered them to Havana, and it never came to anything. It was a kind of a half-assed plot. But anyway, they were, the CIA was highly invested in this in 1960-61. In 1967, those same mafia bosses were in trouble with the law, and they turned around and blackmailed the CIA. This is how they did it. They went to Drew Pearson, this well-known syndicated columnist, and they told him the story. They said, well, it was Rosselli's lawyer who told the story. And he said, these guys were hired by the CIA to, um, uh, to assassinate Castro. And they added this little twist on the story, which was that Ca they said Castro had figured out that there was a plot and had turned around and orchestrated the assassination of President Kennedy in return. So when Drew Pearson ran the story, and Drew Pearson was one of the most popular syndicated columnists in the country. His column appeared in like a thousand papers. So if Drew Pearson said something, you know, people in Washington had to respond, and this was a sensation. Bobby Kennedy immediately went to, to Dick Helms and said, what's going on here? And Johnson calls in Helms and says, please explain. And so Helms investigates himself, <laughs> as a CIA lawyer investigates himself, he gets a big report on all of these plots, and he gives it to Johnson, warts and all. And he says, this is what we were doing. And he's Johnson's impressed that Helms doesn't deny it or anything. He says, no, here's exactly what we did, and you know, we're not embarrassed or anything about it. You know, this is what we did. And so that was the first time that the mafia blackmailed the CIA. And it worked. Um, the, uh, the CIA said, you know, don't touch these guys, the two mafia figures. We don't want them talking about this anymore. Four years later, in 1971, the Mafia bosses, Johnny Rosselli's under investigation again, and they play the blackmail card again. They go to Jack Anderson, who, was, who worked with Drew Pearson, who was also an investigative reporter, very popular, and they tell him the whole story with even more accurate details. And there is, that was January 1971, there is real panic in the White House about, like, what are we going to do? And so they call in Johnny Rosselli's lawyer, and they say, look, we don't want Mr. Rosselli talking to a grand jury about this. He was scheduled to go before a grand jury on something else in Los Angeles. And he was threatening to talk about it in the grand jury, where it would immediately leak. He would know that. And the CIA would be terribly embarrassed. So Nixon knows this, and he has his Justice Department talk to Rosselli's lawyer. And they set up this deal, and they say, Mr. Rosselli, you don't have to talk to the grand jury. Just talk to our prosecutors here in Washington and tell them your story. And please don't mention your service to the US government back in 1961. <laughs> and it works. The CIA goes through INS and the Immigration and Naturalization Service. What Rosselli was really worried about was not just being convicted, but if he was being convicted, he would have been deported to Italy, a country that he had never lived in. 
he had been born there when he was a kid. And so the CIA goes to INS, and I found the document, and they say to INS, you know, please don't deport Mr. Russell. So the issue of these Castro assassination plots has now risen in the, in the eyes of the CIA, and it's gone up to the, to the level of Attorney General John Mitchell and the CIA. <coughs> the CIA is obviously vulnerable to blackmail on, on this point. Nixon understands that. Um, you know, like, did, how did he know it? He was just a canny political operator. And so Nixon is always probing Helms. Tell me about the, the Castro assassination plots. Except Nixon talks about it in a coded way. He says, tell me about the whole Bay of Pigs thing. The Bay of Pigs was the CIA's failed invasion in 1961, and, which was happened right at the time of the Castro assassination. Right from the start of his presidency, Nixon is always pressing the CIA. Eight months later, in June 1972, after the arrest of the Watergate burglar, both Helms and Nixon are in a panic, right? Five of the seven burglars worked for the CIA. One of them was his good friend, Howard Hunt. Another was James McCord, who was a senior officer in what's called the Office of Security. The Office of Security is like the internal police force of the CIA. So it's actually where the CIA handles very sensitive missions, you know, kind of off the book. Um, so McCord is under arrest. Um, uh, Hunt is on the lam. Uh, Frank Sturgis, Bernard Barker, and Rolando Martinez are longtime CIA assets, all of them associated with the Bay of Pigs operation. And so Helms and Nixon are very upset and trying to figure out what are we going to do? How can we, you know, obfuscate or obscure our links to all of these men? Um, and Nixon goes to his chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, and he says, look, it's time to call in Helms. Play it tough. They play it tough. We're going to play it tough. You know, real gangster talk. You know, it's like Nixon would have done well with the Sopranos. It's like that's exactly the kind of dialogue that this is. <laughs> You know, and he says to Holden, he says, look, here's, here's how you play. You get Helms in here and you tell him that if he lets this investigation of burglars go through, it's going to blow the whole Bay of Pigs thing. Now, Helms remembers the meeting from eight months before, right? Helms only had a couple of individual meetings with Nixon in the Oval Office the whole time they were in government together. So it was a big deal when Nixon raised that he shot John Evans with Helms. Helms remembers it eight months later, and hey, it's blackmail time again. Now Nixon's blackmailing Helms. Like, get with the program, or else you're going to have, you're going to get exposed around JFK, like the ultimate third rail for the CIA to be implicated in JFK's assassination. And this isn't coming from some conspiracy theorist. This is coming from his boss, the president. So when Haldeman delivers the word <laughs> to in Helms, in a very close meeting in a very tiny room. Helms explodes. This is a very composed, gentlemanly man, never known to lose his composure. He was very angry when Nixon threatened to blackmail him in this way. And he goes up and says, this doesn't have a damn thing to do with the man Pigs. Helms would later deny that he ever raised his voice, which is not very credible because the other three people in the room said he was shouting. Um, but it was a very, very sensitive and so that's when, when Howard Baker talks about all the, the secrets that Helms and, and Nixon had on each other, it was this, the combination of the Castro assassination plots and their possible relation to Kennedy's assassination. That was a very sensitive issue between the two men. And the fact that Nixon pulled that, played that card on Helms in his moment of need showed just how, you know, he thought that this was going to be a real know, something that would really give him leverage over Helms. And it does. Helms goes along. And that day, he sent, after that meeting, he sends his deputy over to talk to um, Patrick Gray, the acting director of the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover had just died a month before. So Gray was the brand new director of the FBI. And Helms and Nixon figure he's not J. Edgar Hoover. They can push him around. And so they go there, and, they, and, and Helms is... Helms' deputy, the deputy director of the CIA, tells Gray, 
you better taper off the investigation. Taper off the investigation. That was the word that Helms told his deputy to tell Gray. And so Gray tapers off the investigation. He's not going to interview this guy. He's not going to interview that guy. He tells Helms, you know, it's all, it's all well and good. But then, you know, the story keeps bubbling along for, um, you know, a couple of weeks. Helms, again, a very smooth operator, does something very, very ingenious. He takes a vacation. <laughs> he tells his bosses, don't worry about this water, his underlings, don't worry about this Watergate thing. Just deny all. I have to go inspect the CIA station in New Zealand <laughs> and Sydney. The CIA director had never been to Australia and New Zealand in the, in the 20 year history of the agency. But now was the time that Helms <laughs> had to go. And so he leaves his, his, his underlings to deal with this bubbling scandal and reporters calling and they don't know what to do. When he gets back, Gray says, um, Mr. Holmes, I'd like it in writing, you know, if we're gonna do this, and, you know. And of course, the CIA will say that in a meeting. Oh yeah, we're going to lobby. They will never put it in writing. And so when Gray demands it in writing, Helms says, and his men say, no, 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 we're not going to put that in writing. And Gray resumes his investigation, and he figures, well, you know, we're just going to go ahead, and the CIA's not meddling with this anymore. So Helms played ball with Nixon uh, for, for the first month of the, and goes along with the cover-up, um, and that buys him a little bit of time, and um, he's, um, you know, feeling pretty good, like, you know, this is going to, this is all going to work out. But it's at that point that the, the, the interests of Richard Nixon and Richard Helms begin to diverge. And um, Nixon stops seeing him. Uh, Helms is mostly working on the cover-up, talking to Justice Department officials, trying to make sure that certain CIA people, the people who knew all about Hunt's relationship with the CIA, didn't get interviewed. Um, and by the following December, December 1972, Nixon wins re-election, calls Helms to a meeting at Camp David, and fires him. Helms takes this very smoothly, says, of course, Mr. President, I serve it for your, your pleasure. Um, I'd like to leave in um, three months when I turn 60. Um, that's a mandatory retirement age at the CIA. And Nixon says, sure, 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 but if you come out here, we'll be wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, a, a promise, a promise which he immediately breaks, oh. um, and uh, uh, and appoints a new CIA director in, in January, and um, uh, and Helms moves on. Now, in the meeting, in the meeting with Helms and Nixon, and this goes to the blackmail thing. There was one person sitting in the meeting, John Ehrlich, the guy who had been going out on the fools there and was getting the Bay of Pigs report. Ehrlichman always said that what happened in that meeting was blackmail, and that Helms had blackmailed Nixon. He didn't write this in a book, he wrote it in a novel about Watergate, but that was clearly what he thought. He thought that Helms had blackmailed Nixon into giving him help. At the end of the meeting, Nixon agreed to give Helms an ambassadorship, to name him to be ambassador to Iran, which was kind of like, so Helms wasn't fired, didn't look like he had anything to do with Watergate. It was a very good transition Helms. He was very proud of himself for orchestrating that. Ehrlichman thought it was blackmail, and Helms was always very sensitive about the question. 20 years later, uh, in the 1990s, Oliver Stone makes his movie about Richard Nixon, called Nixon. And in the, uh, in the movie, um, he has a scene between Nixon, played by Anthony Hopkins, and Helms, played by Sam Waterston that is kind of based on that October 8th, 1971 conversation about the who shot Donnelly. And in the movie, it, 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 it's kind of clear in a very cryptic way that the implication is, is that Helms was blackmailing Nixon. So this is about 1990. Helms has been retired for 20 years, but his skills as a spy are undiminished. And somehow he obtains the script to the movie before it goes into production. And he fires off a letter from a high-powered law firm that says, Dear Mr. Stone, if you put this in the movie, we are going to sue, because this is libelous. The president would, Mr. Helms would never blackmail the president. That's how sensitive Helms was about the, uh, the issue of blackmailing the president. So uh, I talked to Stone, Stone showed me the letter from Helms, and I talked to him about it. He said, 
that scene doesn't appear in the movie. He said, I, 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 he said, I cut it, but only for reasons of length. I wasn't concerned about the loss of film. I talked to a friend of stuff, but he said, that is absolutely the reason. <laughs> that was because of the threat of litigation. Um, but he did include it in the director's cut of Nixon, which if you get the long version, it's in there. And, and Helms never sued. Um, and it, it does, it's a very good scene because it does say something about the relationship of, 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 of the two men. And it really speaks to that, the, how, what Howard Baker said was just what these two, how much these two men had on each other and how they dealt with each other. So, and that might, I think that kind of leads to the kind of the last big theme of the book, which is, um, you know, the hidden hand of the CIA. I mean, it, it was very real. Um, it was a, a live issue between Helms and Nixon. And it was utterly unknown. And it really shaped the scandal in a lot of key ways. Um, you know, uh, this, this tense interaction between the men around issues that law enforcement didn't know anything about, Congress didn't know anything about, the press didn't know anything about. But they were really determinative and decisive in how the scandal unfolded. So that's really kind of another point of the book is just, you know, that that is something that we could not see at all at the time. You know, and Watergate was kind of my, you know, that's when I kind of started paying attention to politics and started understanding and reading, the, you know, the Tribune and reading Newsweek and trying to figure out what was going on and all that. And, you know, intense coverage, hundreds of reporters, TV, investigated by Congress. And they really, you know, the Senate Watergate Committee and Howard Baker got a little piece of the story, which didn't even make it into the final report of the Watergate Committee. But that was all, you know, that was all. This story really didn't come out. People started writing some books in the 80s that began to get pieces of it, but it really didn't come out at all at the time. And so, you know, people said, well, you know, could that happen today? And I gotta say, it, it sure could, you know? Sure could, and you know the the bigger point is that the uh, you know the CIA is a big powerful institution in Washington with enduring interests. You know, presidents come and go, and the CIA is still there. And so, ironically, as I say in the in the, in the conclusion to the book, Watergate, while very damaging to the CIA because of the involvement of Trump in the court and all the investigations, um, and which eventually even reached Helms himself. Um, and the CIA takes a real hit. The Senate investigates in 1975. Congress creates what we, this, the structure we still have now, the House and Senate Intelligence Committee. So these committees now review all of CIA covert operations. Back in Helms's day, Helms went to one person, the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and he said, here's our budget for next year. And the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee said, Thank you very much, Mr. Helms. And Helms would say, do you want to know anything about what we do? And the chairman would say, no, I don't want to know anything about what we do. And that was the end of it. The CIA had a blank check from Congress. After 1975, after all the investigations, that ended. The House and Senate Intelligence Committee had access to CIA operations, had oversight. Um, Congress created the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Courts which would review CIA applications to spy on Americans, that sort of thing. So a whole new regulatory regime is put on the CIA after Watergate. But that, by diffusing responsibility for CIA operations, it actually protected the CIA. And so, you know, this oversight committee, this structure didn't prevent the Iran-Contra scandal, where CIA officials conspired with the Reagan White House to bypass Congress. It didn't prevent the creation of the torture regime after 9-11. It didn't catch the intelligence failures around Iraq weapons of mass destruction. And so the CIA has emerged, you know, 50 years after Watergate, really in the Washington constellation of power institutions, the CIA's position is almost as strong as it was in 1972. And that's another lesson of Watergate, is that while this transformed American politics, it actually did not transform the constellation of power in Washington. So I think I'll stop there and uh, take any questions you have. Anything you remember about Watergate? <laughs> yeah. So um, what, in regards to Hunt, did you ever discover um, Hunt to have any connection? Yeah, okay. 
Mine was not. Mine was not. Uh, I did not. Um, and, uh, you know, the question about the King assassination, uh, because it was not a subject of this book, I didn't, I didn't delve into it. Um, you know, in 1967, J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, said in a memo to his underlings about the Cohen, about the Cohen Tell program, the counterintelligence program, they called it, which was a program Hoover had started in 1958 or 1959 to harass people who he considered subversives, you know, Martin Luther King, the ban the bomb people, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, Socialist Workers Party, anybody he didn't like. And so in the, in the memo in 1967, he tells the FBI that we have to pay special attention to the civil rights leadership. And the goal of the program is identifying and neutralizing black leaders. That's the term Hoover used. And so the connection to the King assassination, I think, goes back to that memo, where it was clear that that's what Hoover wanted. And there were there was another assassination. Fred Hampton was the head of the Black Panther Party in Chicago, was assassinated in December 1969, less than a year after King. And in that case, this, the, the, the FBI basically admitted culpability and that it was a COINTELPRO operation. So we do have evidence that, that the COINTELPRO operation resulted in assassination. They paid a big settlement to Hampton's family. So that's when you talk about official complicity in the King assassination, that's kind of the evidence that I know of. That's where it goes. Was the CIA involved? You know, the guy who was convicted, uh, James Earl Ray, had an uncanny ability to travel, um, you know, cross borders, uh, obtain passports. That seems very CIA like. Um, but I could never have any solid evidence that he had, had been manipulated or controlled by the CIA. And not convicted, but pled guilty. Pled guilty, yeah. Um, so if you would, if, if you, if Hunt were to be poking around and if you would see him in those days in like Memphis, what, because I, I, I know someone who claims that they did see him the day before. In Memphis. In West Memphis. Uh huh. Which is another question I had. Did you ever run across hearing about an airport in West Memphis that the CIA was using in covert operations? I never, I never heard about that. So if you would see Hunt in those early those days in like the Kings, what on earth would Hunt? I mean, he Hunt had his hand in like every single major thing. What would they be using Hunt for? And then okay, just 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 speculate. What would they be using Hunt for? I mean. Since I don't know that he was there, I mean, it's very difficult for me to say. In 1968, Hunt was uh, running covert operations for the European division. Um, uh, so he was working in headquarters. That was nominally his assignment at that time. I mean, you know, somebody visually identifies Hunt in West Memphis. I mean, you know, Hunt did organize assassinations. That was, that was part of his job, but, you know, I mean, I, all I can say is who knows. I, I, I really, I really rather not speculate about it because you know you can be totally wrong. You know, and it's like you can't make conclusions based on your premises. Right. You know, and so I'm not going to make any conclusions based on a, a premise that Hunt was involved or present. Yeah. It's been almost 60 years since the assassination of Kennedy, yeah. and the Warren Commission that said Oswald had done it. Wouldn't you think if it had been a story other than that, someone would have spilt the beans? I mean, that usually would happen. Uh, you know, that's a reasonable proposition, but you know, you have to remember CIA covert operations, um, somebody once said, are designed to be secret from conception to eternity. And in a conceptualized operation, and Dick Helms was quite explicit about this in his memo, because it's a big debate among CIA people. Can you actually run a totally compartmentalized operation that nobody ever knows about? And Helm says explicitly in his memoir, the answer to that question is yes. We know how to do that. So do we have proof of, you know, who killed Kennedy, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt if somebody else was involved besides Oswald? No, we don't. But that doesn't mean there wasn't a compartmentalized operation. 
in, in my view. And I think that given what we know of the official story with the evidence that has come out over the years, the official story is not true. I mean, it can't be true forensically, you know, for a bunch of reasons, very specific factual reasons. So the official story isn't true and we don't have a better explanation. That's kind of where we are after 60 years. I would say one other thing about that. You say, well, wouldn't we know after 50 years? If you were to ask American historians in 1964, the year the Warren Commission came out, if you'd ask them, did Thomas Jefferson have a relationship with a woman that he owned, Sally Hemings? 99% of American historians would have said, that's nonsense. There's no truth to that one, none whatsoever. If you ask American historians today, 99% would say, absolutely, it is true. So the expert opinion, the conventional wisdom of the experts can be totally transformed in the course of 60 years. And I think that is what's gonna happen with Kennedy's assassination. In the fullness of time, it's not gonna happen next week or next year, but in the fullness of time, I think it will become understood that President Kennedy was killed by his enemies. He wasn't killed by one of his enemies. And I think Nixon understood that too. That's why he went after Helms, because he, he had leverage. He had something that he could really stick him with and make him move, make him respond. And it did work. So. That's what I would leave it as far as JFK's assessment. I think that's about the most you can say, or the most I'm willing to say. Yeah. Who are your favorite spy novelists or Johnny Lee novels? <laughs> uh, um, unlike uh, Dick Helms, you know, Dick Helms was a better spy than, than literary critic. He thought Hunt's books were great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he hated John Le Carre. Um, and I thought Hunt's books were crap, um, like everybody else in Hollywood. And I think John Le Carre's books are, are, are great. I mean, they're the most realist, realistic depiction of intelligence work and the, the milieu of the intelligence milieu of secret intelligence. Secret intelligence is a profession unto itself. And Le Carre really captures that. He's not the only one. Um, you know, the I mean he's British intelligence. Course, which is you know a different culture and institution than the CIA, but um, the Good Shepherd uh, is a movie directed by Robert De Niro in about 2007. It's a very good you know, and I've talked to people who say a very true to life depiction of the early years of the CIA. So yeah, I like uh, um, I like John John Le Carre, uh, Graham Greene, uh, his spy novels I think are, are, are very good. I'd say those are probably my favorite. Yes. Um, how involved do you think the CIA is now with the current status of, for example, we can't find the text. We don't know where they are from the first missing. The Secret Service and the CIA are how how are well, they in the I wouldn't I wouldn't so I mean the, oh, the, so sorry. I wouldn't I, I wouldn't tax the CIA with the sins of the Secret Service. They are different institutions. Oh, dang. And, um, <laughs> we have two of them? <laughs> and, and the, and the um, in 1995, when they were, they were seeking all the government's JFK records, they went to the CIA, to the Secret Service, and they said, you know, we're gonna, we want to see all your records from 1962. And the Secret Service immediately destroyed like tons of records tons of JFK records. This is in 1992. <clears throat> wow. So th this is what the Secret Service does, is the way that they protect their power is they don't alienate presidents, right? They want every president to know that everything that we do for you is secret. And so that was true in JFK's time, and that's true in Trump's time, you know? And they don't care whether, you know, well, you know, Trump's in trouble or people want to know this or that. The, the credo of the CIA is we do not tell, you know, we don't tell tales on our press. So, Secret Service. Secret Service. Secret, Secret yeah. Service, yeah. Um, uh, and, and it doesn't, um, you know, and, and, and they don't care. And they will destroy records we are. Now, where does the CIA stand in the, in the whole, you know, where we are now? Well, one is, I mean, look at, you know, the CIA and 
Trump had a very hostile relationship, at least rhetorically. Um, practically, policy-wise, Trump pretty much gave the CIA everything they wanted. Um, but you know, he felt it was politically useful for him to attack, and they felt it was politically useful for them to counterattack. You know, the second impeachment is driven by a whistleblower from the CIA. Um, it's when that whistleblower comes forward that Nancy Pelosi, who had been saying, no, no, we're not gonna do impeachment. When the CIA got on board, Nancy Pelosi was on board. So that independent power of the CIA in the constellation of Washington, you know, was undiminished. I mean, it didn't work, they didn't get rid of it, but it was a very strong play, you know, that you know, disrupted Trump and created a lot of bad headlines for him and put him on the defensive. So, you know, you see their hand in, in, you know, in current politics today. You know, now, are they out to get Trump the way he says? I mean, you know, all the stuff that Trump accused them of, there was no factual reason. Well, Jeff, I guess what I'm wondering is, how much is the CIA, do you think, involved with January 6th? I, I mean, in your, I, I see no evidence. Of okay. I mean, we know who was involved in January 6th. We've seen them testify. There's no, there's no hidden hand of the CIA in January 6th. Okay, or the Secret Service. In, I mean, in doing what? Well, I mean, just the fact that they're trying to get all these facts and you know they can't get all the evidence. That seems like a reasonable request. I mean, yeah, but I mean, don't, don't overestimate the power of the CIA. They are a foreign intelligence agency. Okay. I mean, they break that rule all the time and mount operations and spy on Americans, but that's not the focus of the organization. When Congress and the Justice Department want information about going to, about January 6th, you know, the CIA could tell them about the foreign travels of these clowns and all of that, but the heart of the story, the CIA doesn't tell them. Anyway. Okay, that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Carl. So, uh, there's so much texture in your presentation, so much anecdotal details and all this stuff. I'm just wondering whether you can describe a little bit about the research that went into this. There must be just a, there must be a lot of fascinating stories about that. Just how all this, how your knowledge of this stuff came to be, and like what well, extra stuff you're sitting on that didn't make. You, know, <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying? Well, the, 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 good, the good thing about this book was because so much has been written about Watergate, it's pretty easy to kind of master. The existing record, you know, the reports of the Senate Watergate Committee, the reports of the House Judiciary Committee on impeachment, um, you know, the account, the popular accounts, like all the president's men. So when when I saw that array, I thought I'm going to go thinking of that movie. I'm like, why didn't they follow up on the CIA? So I started focusing on what, where can you find new sources of information, and I found a bunch. Like, a lot of the Howard Hunt story, I knew that Hunt was friends with William F. Buckley, the, the conservative columnist. Hunt was a prolific writer. Buckley was a prolific writer. Hunt was a hardline anti communist. Buckley was a hardline anti communist. And so I figured these two men, if they had a correspondence, that might be interesting. Hunt might, you know, be honest or unburden himself with Buckley and his correspondence. So Buckley's papers are at Yale, um, but the correspondence which is voluminous. Buckley wrote dozens of letters a day for you know decades. Um, it was closed. So I know Chris Buckley, Buckley's son, just from the Washington Party circuit. He's not like a friend, but he knows my name. So I called him up and I said, Chris, I want to, I'm writing this book. I want to know about your father's friendship with him. He said, yeah, Jeff, that's really interesting. He said, so yes, you have my permission to do that. So I, it was COVID. I couldn't go to the library. So I, I hired a graduate student at Yale. And I said, go copy all the ex all these files, you know, from the from the Buckley correspondence. That's where most of the story that I told about Howard Hunt and the James Bond and all of that, it was in that correspondence. So that was just like like figuring out where was there like a cool source of information that nobody had touched before. Another one I just saw mentioned in a book, Earl Silbert was the first Justice Department prosecutor of the Watergate burglar. When the case was first being prosecuted, they put Earl Silbert in charge. He was a career Justice Department attorney. He kept a diary for the first year of Watergate. And, and not even really a diary, you just go, go home and dictate notes. Um, but in the course of a year, it was like a thousand pages of notes. A 
couple of years ago, he donated that diary. He's still around. I've been talking to him, him and his daughter. And he donated that diary to the National Archives. Like, nobody had written about it at all. It was another gold mine of just, you know, somebody who was there at the ground floor and wondering, like, uh, is this guy him pulling the wool over my eyes? Which he was, you know. <laughs> um, and... But you had that authentic, in-person voice. So that was like another, that's the kind of source that really makes the book come alive. So when you talk about, like, where does that detail come from? It comes from looking for, like, there's some source that nobody else has had before. And then others, you know, like the story of the Who Shot John Angle, you know, that tape has been around for a long time. Watergate historians have mentioned it. I mean, Oliver Stone and his screenwriters surely knew about it. But nobody had really like gone back and like what was that conversation all about and it's one of the it's really a, i mean you could almost do like a whole movie about that one conversation because it's so it's so byzantine and, and machiavellian um but a very original you know piece of material so that's i mean i that's what i look for to make this book come alive you've got to find things like that you know to make it jump off the page Um, as far as the press, immediately after the break, Watergate break-in, losing the thread about yes. the CIA, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Is that just a, is that just the way it is? Hard, it's hard to do. No, 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 no. Or was the CIA using special efforts to clamp down on anything? No, absolutely. Yeah. Helms and the CIA spun it very cleverly. So the burglars are arrested, and the CIA puts out a, a statement that says. These men are former employees with whom we've had no contact since they were retired. You know, that was complete nonsense. Hunt, Helms had been touting Hunt, you know, a, a month before the break. Um, McCord, when, after he retired from the CIA in 1970, went into the private security business. And he took referrals from the CIA employment office. So when, when CIA people would retire, and they'd say, you know, I'm retired, because they had mandatory retirement, but I want to keep working. They'd say, no. Jim McCord's hiring over, you know, just go across the street here. So it was like, McCord was practically an extension of the CIA. So those relationships were very baked in. One key thing, and this, is, this was probably the most important thing that happened in terms of Washington Post, was after Hunt retired, he went to work for a Washington public relations firm called the Mullen Company. And um, they told, as part of you know talking to the press, uh, they said the head of the Mullen Company would brief reporters and he would tell people the reporters Hunt had no connection with the CIA, which was false because he was in fact the point of contact. And there were two other people working at the Mullen Company who used the company as a front for their CIA operations, and Hunt was a third. So Woodward talked to the head of the Mullen Company in July 1970 and was told that no Hunt had no that Mullen had no connection with the CIA. And and that guy later wrote a memo back to uh, back to Helms and he said, you know, Woodward was suitably grateful about the information that we had shared. And so the fact that the Mullen company was a CIA front was sort of sitting right out there in public. It didn't appear in the Washington Post for two years. And it wasn't until the Senate Watergate Committee in the summer of 74 actually had, you know, exposed it and, 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 and put it on the record. Um, but, you know, the detail, so, so yes, the, the Post was spun away from that story. And, Hel and Helms' people did the spinning. But, you know, there's also a powerful secrecy apparatus around it. And I found a memo about, about Hunt and the Mullen Company from 1970. Um, later in 1970, saying that Hunt had been cleared for participation in a CIA operation. And as late as like 2017, the code name of that operation was still was still classified. So, you know, the CIA had the ability not just in dealing with individual reporters to spin people away from the story, but also just to keep things off the record forever, you know? And so then as a reporter, you're left with, well, here's a here's a document with a blank name in it, you know, you can't really use that, you know, it's like, you don't know what's under the under the redaction, so 
it's kind of useless. And that's a very good, effective tool for the CIA to keep people away from their business. Anything else? Yeah. Just, just, just a great summary. I, I know you researched, you wrote, you reflected. I, I just don't know how you tell the story so well. It's just awesome. Well, you know, this is a book. Book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let me work that in. I still got the tips. Um, no, all of my book, Our Man in Mexico, is about Wynn Scott, the head of the CIA in Mexico in the 1960s. The Ghost is about Jim Angleton, head of counterintelligence from 1954 to 1974. And Scorpion Stance is about Dick Helms, deputy director and director of the CIA. So those three men all were in the Office of Strategic Services the precursor to the CIA during World War II. They were all friends and they all rose in the ranks of the CIA. So having written three books about it, that's why I can talk so fluently about it because they actually are all sort of about the same milieu. So are you ready to take on Tucker Carlson? <laughs> <laughs> Never again, right? <laughs> off the point a little bit, but what type of staffing was the post be doing on this January 6th thing? I mean, how many people or? Oh, uh, dozens, dozens. Uh, probably now, probably, yeah, probably two, two dozen reporters taking on different hats, I think. You know, because there'll be, there'll be different, you know, there'll be people doing long-range investigative stuff, there'll be people doing breaking news, you know, there'll be you know, it's such it's such a big story. You've got the you know you've got the Georgia case now. Um, you've got you've got all these new witnesses. Um, you've got the Justice Department story. Are they going to invite? Are they going to indict him? So it's a it's a hydra at this point. It, it, there are so many there's so many stories out there. Um, and now that Bezos owns the post, they're they're very well funded, and so they can afford you know which they you know five years ago they wouldn't have been able to afford. It. And now they have the money to do it. So, um, you know, and I think I think they're doing a, a great job. But really, you know, Congress is doing a great job in terms of uncovering the story that we didn't know. The press is in this one. The, the press is not ahead of the congressional investigators. The congressional investigators are, are you know are making the story because they have subpoena power. You know, and the, and the press doesn't. So they can compel it. You know, you know the reporters. All you can do is talk people into it. You know, a lot of times they don't want to do it. They certainly, in the Watergate era, there were more people willing to talk than in the Trump era. Okay? Thank you all for coming.